Our scripture passage this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Listen carefully for the word of God. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you are called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, who is Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. I don't know if you all have ever played that drinking game. Oh, I'm sure you've never played a drinking game. Do you know this drinking game, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? Anybody familiar with this? Where you try to find somebody says the name of any actor or actress, and then everyone else tries to figure out a line of relationships through acting back to Kevin Bacon. So, for example, if one of you shouted out, George Clooney, then I might say, okay, George Clooney was in Ocean's Eleven with Matt Damon, and Matt Damon was in The Departed with Jack Nicholson, and Jack Nicholson was in as um, A Few Good Men with Kevin Bacon. Okay, you, you got that? So that means that George Clooney has a bacon number of three, Matt Damon a bacon number of two, and Jack Nicholson a bacon number of one. Does that make sense? I think this comes out of two things. One, out of the idea that, that Kevin Bacon is one of the most uh, prolific acting actors in Hollywood, so he has more relationships with more actors and actresses than most, but also from this sociological idea that of six degrees of separation, that every human being is connected to every other human being on the face of the earth by no more than six successive lines of acquaintances. But if we think that six degrees of separation or six degrees of Kevin Bacon is something else, what's even crazier is that recent scientific studies are discovering that every human being living at any given time in human history is no more than eight generations away from a direct ancestral or familial genetic link to every other living human being on the planet. How wild is that? And now for those of us who take Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve literally, we have always lived under this assumption that we, you go far enough back and we're all blood brothers and sisters. But now if you are not taking this literally but more of the scientific mindset, what we're discovering now is that science is saying the exact same thing that people of faith are supposed to have believed all along. That we are way more closely interconnected than anyone possibly imagined before. In 2013, not that long ago, 10 years ago, Stanford did a study where they found that all human beings on this planet share 99% 0.9% of our DNA. And of that 0.1%, that one in a thousandth DNA that is different, that 96% of that just pertains to the different anomalies and differences that we see within cultures and groups of people. That in fact, it's only 4% of that 0.1% or four out of 10,000 parts of our DNA that in total explain all of the differences that we see between peoples and cultures and different tribes and ethnicities. 4% of 0.1% are the differences that we see. And I have to wonder, 
what U.S. Navy Commodore Josiah Tutnall would say about this. Because he was the first one to introduce to the English language in the lexicon this idea that blood is thicker than water. In fact, he used it as an insistence that the U.S. Navy had to get involved with the British. We had to come to the defense of the British in the Second Opium War at the Battle of Taku Fort against the Chinese. And what he said is we have to go to the aid of our British brothers and sisters because blood is thicker than water. What do you think it would have done to his mindset perhaps to our entire history of international relations, of war and conflict, if he understood, if we understood that he was probably maybe more closely connected genetically to the Chinese he was fighting against than the British soldier he was fighting beside. And how might it change the entire calculus of what's happening in the Middle East right now? If we all truly understood, if the Hamas terrorists understood that they may be closer genetically by blood to the Israelis that they're killing than the terrorists that they're fighting beside, what difference would it make? How would it change the calculus or the equation if the Israeli soldiers understood that, that the babies who are being killed in Gaza may be as close or closer in their familial link than the babies who had been killed in the kibbutz. And I'm not saying that Israel doesn't have an absolute right to defend itself. Not only do they have a right, they have a responsibility <coughs> to stop Hamas and to do whatever it takes to make sure that this can never happen again. But what would it do to all of us here on this side of the ocean, all over the world, if we really understood what science and the Bi what the Bible has always told us, what science is telling us more and more, that we are one, that their children are our children, and our children are their children, how would that change things if we really understood that we may be more closely connected, we may have a more genetic tie to every Israeli Jew and Gaza Palestinian to every North and South Korean to every Russian and Ukrainian to every Maori and Aborigine to every Hutu and Tutsi than we do to the Brit that we play golf beside at our country club or the Angelian you're sitting beside right now in worship. Paul was clear about this. This was the theme of his entire book of Ephesians. Throughout Ephesians, he talks about our responsibility to understand that we are one. He lays it out at the very beginning. This book, it's one of the four um, prison epistles, uh, Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, and Philippians. These are the four books that Paul wrote from prison. It's some of his most articulate, most beautifully written, and theologically insightful of all of his letters. It was John Calvin's favorite of his letters, and partially because he talks about the unity that we are expected to have, not just with each other, but with the entire world. He begins in chapter 1, he says, With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. All things. Paul goes throughout the rest of this book, he's clear over and over again that we as Christians, our role in this world, our job in this world is to help God to bring together all peoples and really all of creation into one under God and then with one another. And so then he goes on in chapter 4, this verse that we read this morning. He says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through this bond of peace. 
And he goes into this rant, and he says, For there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Do you get an idea that maybe Paul is trying to say something here? Could he be more clear? That this is our job in the world. This is our job as Christians. Not everyone is going to believe like we believe. But if we believe in this man, Jesus Christ, if we believe in this new covenant that Jesus died to bring into this world, then we have to believe that God is working through us and has given us this ministry of reconciliation, of bringing together all people from all over the world, all things, all of creation, back into relationship. First with God, and then with each other. Well, today is the beginning of our stewardship series and this sermon series, which again, ironically, we have called Interconnected at a time when both the fracturing of this world and the interconnection of this world could not be on bigger display. And as we come out of this time of incredible separation and isolation of broken community that has been the pandemic in these last few years, what the research is already starting to show us is that this spike, this skyrocketing rate of depression, of violence, of self-loathing and hurt, this, this skyrocketing instance, instances of mental health crises for so many people, have a direct link to the isolation that we have experienced over the last couple of years. And I am convinced that as more time goes on and we have more time to understand that the PTSD we've experienced from being separated from each other and held apart from each other is going to be very much connected to what's going on in Ukraine and this explosion in the Middle East and what's happening in our own country politically and what's happening around the world and even this inflation. I am sure that it is all tied together. As we spend time and everybody's talking about, okay, what is going to be the new normal in so many aspects of our life? What does it look to put back in place the building blocks of a healthy, rich, full, inspired life? And what does our own generosity, our gen the generosity of our time and our presence our money and our effort and our community and our relationship have to do with building a life worth living. It's like the whole world has been thrown up with this giant fruit basket thrown up into the air and we're all asking, what is the new normal going to look like? What's it going to look like for our work lives? <clears throat> how many days a week should a typical work week be? And how many of those days should we get to work from home? And how often should we be in the office? When is it still okay to do meetings by Zoom? And when is it better to have them face to face? As the inflation continues to spiral upward and we find ourselves spending more and more of our money on things like gas and groceries and rent. How are we going to spend whatever discretionary money we have left over? How are we going to take seriously the importance of our leisure time and what will we prioritize? How often will we go out? How often will we be with friends and family? How often will we go and travel to be with those that we love? How much time will we spend inside? And how much time do we need to be outside? How much time will we spend online? And how much time do we need to spend with other people face to face, in relationship, in connection? These are not just quality of life kinds of questions. These are fundamental health of our souls kind of questions. What will it look like as we rebuild our lives, as we try to put back in place the pieces of the puzzle of what makes for a good and full and integrated and thriving life? 
In the same way that our financial advisors are always telling us that we need to rebalance our portfolios, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to rebalance this portfolio that we call life. How are we going to spend our time? How are we going to spend our energy? How are we going to invest in and then fiercely protect community and this inner connection that is what life is based on and what makes life worth living? And part of that is becoming really clear how we were created to live, how God created us to be in relationship and in community. What does that look like? Well, when Jesus was asked what it looks like, what is the meaning of life? What is the purpose for me being here? He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you two things. One is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he said, and the second one is just like it. He said, it's to love your neighbor as yourself. And I find it so interesting that he equated loving our neighbors, loving each other, as almost being equal with loving God. As if he was saying, the way that you love each other, that is the way that you love me. This is who we are. This is who we've been created to be. And so what does this mean for our stewardship, the stewardship of our time and our talents and our treasures? Well, there's two things I'd like to say. One is it says something about the importance of us just being together. You know, I am so grateful. I'm going to talk to those of you who are online for a moment. I am so grateful that we have been able to create these wonderful online experiences for those of you who are off traveling or live far away or for any reason can't make it here on a given Sunday. And yet the truth of the matter is community is about being together. And this community, it's not the same when you're not here. I am so grateful that we hopefully can take some of this community, take this church and beam it through your devices and into your living rooms or wherever you are. But the truth of the matter is that real community, that this, that this healing health-building, life-giving kind of community happens only when we are face-to-face, -face, when we are together. When we come together, when we emphasize community, when we make this a fundamental part of our lives and who we are and what we're doing in the world, it makes all of the difference. If you want to work on world peace, it starts by coming here and being together and building community because we will take that and we will move that outside the walls of this church and we will literally change the world. And so if you're one of those, and I definitely was one of those for a while, who thinks, oh my gosh, it's so much easier to just sleep in a little bit, be in my pajamas, my cup of coffee for worship. If you're struggling with the inertia of getting yourself going and getting up and coming back here, I will tell you that we will jump up and down and rejoice if you walk through these doors in your pajamas and a mug of coffee. We would love to see that. Because there's something that happens when we're here together that can't be replaced any other way. The other thing I would say is that we need you to prioritize community when you think about how you're going to spend whatever discretionary money you have left after you pay for your gas and your groceries. Because it's getting tighter and the choices are getting more difficult. But in the same way that all of our own costs set costs are going up. The same thing is happening for the church. And if we want to continue to keep the staff that we have and pay the utilities and run the basic programs and ministries that we run here, we're going to need everyone who can to give even more because the cost of everything is going up. And so as we try to figure out what are the essential building blocks to this thriving, full kind of life, 
I would ask you to think about the importance of connection and relationship and community of being together if we want to have anything to do and anything to say to a world that is hurting and desperate for interconnection. You know, I'm not so sure that Kevin Bacon was right anymore. The older I get, the smaller the circles seem to become, the less degrees of separation I'm seeing around me. I think that science and the Bible, it's all saying the same thing, and it could not be more loud or clear. We are one. Whether we like it or not, we are intimately interconnected. And as Martin Luther King said, we will either rise as one or we will die as fools. So what does it look like in your own life to prioritize and then fiercely fight for community and relationship and interconnection? And what does that mean about the generosity of your, your time and your presence your willingness to build relationship and community. I want us to spend a few moments praying for peace in Israel and Gaza. I want us to spend some time thinking about how, what role do we have to play and how might our commitment to community, to relationship, to a faith community be a first step in us working towards world peace. What commitments do you want to make this year to, to this church, to yourself, to a thriving full life and what that really actually looks like? We're going to give you some moments to pray, to ponder, to think, and then Laura will close us in prayer. Let us pray and meditate together.